Good afternoon and welcome to the Federal Railroad Administration's Fiscal Year 2021 Research Funding Programs webinar. Before we begin, I would like to take you through the items you see on your screen. The top left window of the screen is where the PowerPoint presentation is being displayed. If you are having issues viewing the presentation slides after the webinar begins, ensure first that you are not using the Microsoft Edge browser. If using another browser, exit the webinar and either reload your browser or re-enter the webinar, or re-enter the webinar through the Adobe Connect desktop application. I want to let uh, our participants know that we are having some bandwidth um, internet issues on the East Coast, specifically where I'm at in Virginia Beach. Uh, so if there are um, technical issues today, it may be because of that. I know Cox is having some major issues today. So we apologize in advance um, and uh, hopefully nothing will happen and we'll, we'll just continue with the webinar. All right, at the bottom left of your screen in the Troubleshooting Tips pod are some internet network um, video and audio troubleshooting tips, excuse me, steps to ensure that participants can both hear and see the presentation. Next to the Troubleshooting Tips pod is the Technical Support pod, and this is where you can ask our technical team uh, questions about, with, about any technical issues you are having. On the bottom right is the web links pod. To view the web links, double click the title of the link. And the web links pod here has some handy web links for today's presentation. Above the web links pod is the Q&A session questions pod, um, our questions for presenters pod. This is where you can ask questions that will be answered during the question and answer portion of today's presentation. Thanks to all of you who submitted pre-webinar questions. If your questions are not directly addressed in the webinar content, we'll answer them in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. We will also be conducting polls during the webinar. Please ensure that you are not viewing the presentation in full screen mode so that you can participate in the polls. Please note that the webinar presentation materials and a video recording will be uploaded to FRA's website in the next week. Before we begin, I want to go over the webinar format. We will start off with a brief introduction, ask a couple poll questions, and launch into the presentation. We'll ask additional poll questions throughout. Uh, following the presentation portion of the webinar, we will have the question and answer session where FRA will address your questions posted in the Questions for Presenters pod. Today's speakers are Dr. Miriam Alira, Director of FRA's Office of Research Development and Technology. Cam Stewart, uh, Broad Agency Announcement Program Manager for the Office of Research Development and Technology at FRA. Doug Gascon, uh, Acting Chief, Rail Program and Policy Development Division, Office of Railroad Policy and Development at FRA. Jeff Gordon is the Small Business Innovation Research Program Manager uh, of, at the Office of Research Development and Technology at FRA. And we have Melissa Wong, who is a program analyst and program manager for USDOT's Small Business Innovation Research Program. We're going to start with our first polling questions. Our first polling question is, what type of organization do you represent? And you can click the button next to each one and it will automatically fill in your response. Our first response is state, including DC, interstate compact, public agency or publicly chartered authority, local government, Amtrak, industry or consultant or other. And it looks like we've got about 40% who are industry and consultant today, about 38% that are other, 10% um, publicly public agency, excuse me, or publicly chartered authority, and about 7% are from the state, um, and 2% from about the local government. So thank you so much. Our next polling question is: Have you participated in a previous FRA webinar? Yes, I've participated in a live webinar. Yes, I've watched a recorded FRA webinar online. 
No, I have not previously attended or watched any FRA webinars. And we've got our answers rolling in here. It looks like about 33% have participated in a live webinar, about 4% have watched one online, and 62% uh, have not previously attended or watched any FRA webinars. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Alera. Good afternoon. I'm Mary Molly Wire, Director of Research Development and Technology over at uh, Federal Railroad Administration. It is with great pleasure to welcome you to FRA's research funding webinar today. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. Um, I would like to begin with a brief introduction um, of our organization here. As you can see, um, FRA has uh, just shy of uh, 1,000 employees, three-fourths of which are in the field, and about a quarter that are here at the headquarters. Uh, FRA regulates about 700 railroads, and uh, within FRA, the Office of Research Development and Technology receives approximately $40 million dollars annually to do research. The Office of, Railroad, uh, the Office of um, Research Development and Technology is within um, Railroad Policy and Development uh, Office, which is led by Associate Administrator Mr. Paul Nissenbaum. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. The R&D office is, um, as I mentioned, part of um, the railroad policy and development. Um, our mission is to ensure the safe, efficient, and reliable movement of people and goods by rail through applied research. We accomplish that by stakeholder engagements with, um, in particular, with small businesses, um, with contractors, Association of American Railroads, um, universities, and we accomplish our goal by uh, also having a cost-effective procurement. The Office of RDNT is has four major programs, the Track Division, Rolling Stock and Equipment, Train Control and Communication, and Human Factors um, Division. Now, today I'm joined um, by several of my colleagues, including Mr. Cam Stewart, Mr. Jeff Gordon, Ms. Melissa Wong and Mr. Doug Gaskin. And um, we are here to um, share some of the information about our research funding opportunities with you. Um, in the interest of time, I would like to turn it over to uh, Mr. Ken Stewart to kick it off by, by going over our broad agency announcement process. Ken? Thanks, Mary. Welcome everyone. My name is Cam Stewart. I'm in the track division of the Office of Research Development in Technology at FRA. Been here since 2010 and I have essentially run the BAA program since that time. Um, it was my first job in joining the FRA to figure out what a BAA is and how to use it effectively for our mission. And I think we've been pretty successful with it over the years. It's been a very popular program. We've launched a lot of very interesting and worthwhile research from it, and we continue to do it on at least an annual basis. So, we currently have a BAA out on the street right now, and that's why we time the webinar the way we do it. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll hit some of the, uh, the basic highlights of uh, a BAA, Broad AMC announcement, why we use it, how it's structured, and some statistics and I've also been noting some of the questions that have come in before the webinar and during uh, the chat now so I'll try to hit some of those as we go along. What is a BAA? A BAA is a procurement tool. It's governed by federal acquisition regulation which is uh, depicted as a large book which it is and it tells the government, especially the civilian agencies within the government, how to do their procurements. Uh, 
it's used for basic or applied research. And that's a pretty key point. Uh, we tend to uh, uh, leverage ourselves on the applied research end of this rather than basic. We're not National Science Foundation. We're not doing a lot of that really fundamental science that goes into a lot of technology development. We like to get in when the, when the science is pretty well proven and we're ready to start applying that to technology development and solve some problems. So that's our sweet spot. In the BAA document, you will see uh, uh, TRL levels listed uh, in terms of technology readiness level. Uh, we, we start at about a level three and go up until about a level seven. So we don't get into commercialization of products. We can't use the BAA to support products for the sole intent of sale. Uh, we're, we're leveraging this tool to solicit useful research results for the industry as a whole, not for any particular uh, company or organization. It is a competitive process, as, as those have participated in the past know. We have pretty fine filter. You know, we're, we're not funding everything that we get in the door. If uh, uh, we get 100 concept papers in a year, there might be 20 awards that come out out of that process. So we, we take a very close look at all of the information provided. We try to balance the best projects with our available budget and uh, make some worthwhile decisions. Um, we, uh, we like the BAA for a couple reasons. One, it allows us to very efficiently broadcast our research objectives far and wide uh, immediately. Very low level of effort for us to do that. We, they're, they're in the form of topics that are included in Appendix C of the, the package. And so it's very quickly uh, allows us to spread the word throughout the industry to solicit the best best ideas and how to reach those objectives. Uh, we're, we're strongly focused on safety and, and we're also focused on efficiency, state of grid repair type projects. And, and all of our work uh, uh, points to freight and passenger rail in the United States. Awards can be grants, uh, contracts or co-ops. We lean heavily, <laughs> like 100% on the, on the contract, uh, be it fixed price or cost type. It just works better for us and we find that it works well for the participants as well. And one of the nice things about the BAA is we can have open uh, conversations about the topics, about scopes of work and approaches and these types of issues before either we spend a lot of effort reviewing proposals we're really not interested in or you spend a lot of effort preparing those proposals to send to us. We know there's there's quite a bit of effort involved. So the BA encourages us, encourages us to have conversations about what you're thinking about as a response to a topic and and we can discuss it and see if it has any merit and, and provide a little bit of coaching on, on how, to, uh, uh, how to prepare your scope of work in an effective way. Um, it, it's BAA open season right now, so literally my email and my phone never stops ringing. And I enjoy it. It's fun engaging with the industry, and I hope it's useful for you folks as well. I mentioned it's efficient. We don't have to do a detailed SOW. Uh, it does guarantee competition. Uh, we're competing not on a scope of work that we write, but on the scopes of work that you submit. So if we get 20 um, concept papers in on a single topic, that's the comp competitive field. There's 20 folks vying for, for funding uh, for their good ideas. So the, the quality of your statements of work the quality of your concept paper is, as a whole is uh, really key. So you're not, you're not turning a typical RFP that says the contractor uh, uh, shall into the contractor will, excuse me, phone's ringing, um, <laughs> as an example. So these are not, uh, the topics that you'll see in the appendix are not, not easy to solve. If we knew how to solve these uh, problems directly, we would, issue RFPs and go procure the answer. So they're, they're meant to be thought provoking, they're meant to solicit uh, innovative responses and also to get new participants involved in railroad research. And that's one area 
over the last 10 years that has been very successful for us. We have a lot of new players in the rail research uh, arena, and um, part of that's due to our use of the BAA. It's a two-phase process. The first phase is a concept paper. I try to make the, the price of entry as low as possible. It's five pages at a max, and um, uh, it's a menu-driven sort of response. In the BAA document, I, I step through exactly what you need to provide in the order it should be provided and give you an idea of the content that we're looking for under, under each uh, 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 section. So please, if you're preparing concept papers, please follow that, that organization. It makes it much easier for us to review these uh, efficiently. And um, it, I think, will give you the right structure and include all the necessary information you need to provide us to sell us on your, your project idea. If we select your concept paper to move forward, we'll send you a letter inviting a proposal. We'll also send a, a, a letter if we don't accept the concept paper and we'll give you some rationale why, why we didn't care for it. Proposals uh, by invitation are up to 20 pages long. It's essentially a lengthened version of a concept paper. It allows you a little more room to give us some more depth and breadth of your knowledge of the topic, further refine your, your project management plan, uh, provide a detailed cost uh, 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 estimate for the work and, and schedule. There's also some supplemental information that goes in the back of it. Awards are generally 150 to 500K. That varies. I hate to put a range on it. There's no specific uh, limit in the, uh, in the BAA itself. Uh, I will tell you that we designed the BAA to be forward looking. By that, I mean the BAA is not funded with this year's allocation to rd and It's anticipating uh, funding from next for next year. So that'd be FY21 funding that would go towards this year's BAA projects. We've done a lot of them. We've had a lot of success. Um, you know, it, this annual research BAA is the one's on the street right now. And over the years, we've done well over 100 awards out of that, which means I've probably reviewed over a thousand concept papers and proposals. <laughs> It's been a lot of fun. Occasionally, we do some specials. Intelligent Railroad Systems BAA, which is really focused on uh, ITS related issues. Uh, and occasionally, we do a University Research BAA. And that would be res uh, limited to just universities or university led organizations. I should mention that the BAA is open to all eligible participants and the eligibility requirements are in the BAA, but it, basically there are no limits, um, provided your organization is not federally owned. That's the only restriction we put on it. Likewise, we don't have any set-asides, so there's no set-asides for DBEs or uh, small businesses or anything alike. Uh, it's completely wide open, so may the best concept papers win. Uh, this year we have our usual topic areas that cover the four research divisions within our D&T, track, equipment, train control, and human factors. We have a special emphasis this year on, on uh, grade crossings. Uh, we're very focused on grade crossing safety and trespasser prevention. Um, so if you have good ideas on how to, to improve those areas, uh, please send them in. We also have expanded a little bit in the last year or so with some workforce development topics that uh, some may find very interesting. It's a little uh, different uh, uh, flavor for us, but we, we tried it last year and we got some really good awards out of it. So we're, we're doing it again this year. So there's three or four topics in there on workforce development. And lastly, infrastructure resiliency, which is brand new for us. We're supporting our, our grants group in RPD on ways to better assess the resiliency of projects uh, to uh, climate change related issues, as well as looking for better models to uh, measure CO2 emissions and compare those to other modes of transportation. So there's some, some new, new topics in there this year. Deadline is June 4th. Um, at 1159 on June 4th, my email blows up <laughs> and uh, 
I would appreciate it if we got them in a little bit earlier. It's an open period, so we can accept these at any time. In fact, I have a few in-house right now. So if you have it ready, send it on. Uh, just email it to me. Contact information is all in the document, and we'll take it from there. I think that's all I have for today, so I'm going to toss it back to Mary. I think we have another poll coming up. That is correct. We do have another poll coming up. Our polling question is, do you have experience using beta.sam.gov? Yes, extensive. Yes, limited. Or no experience. Looks like uh, today we've got about 60% who have no experience, about 30% who have some limited experience, and about 9% uh, that have um, extensive. Now we will go to uh, Melissa Wong to discuss the Small Business Innovative Research Program. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Wong and I'm the US DOT's SBIR program manager and I manage the program across the modal administrations within US DOT and FRA is a very active participant in this program. So today's agenda for my portion is we're going to discuss what the small business innovation research program is, who is eligible and how we select the projects. Um, and then how does FRA select its topics, and then how to learn more. So the Small Business Innovation Research Program is a program that was established by Congress in 1982. So it's been around a while. Um, and it's a program that was designed to meet federal research and development needs while using small businesses to increase technological innovation and increased private sector commercialization of the innovations that are derived from federal research. So the programs um, really focused on getting small businesses engaged in federal R&D and then helping small businesses get that R&D into a commercial product. So the DOT is, is just one of the agencies that uh, participates in the SBIR program. Any federal agency who has an extramural research budget that, is, that exceeds $100 million, that means they spend more than $100 million outside of their agency on research, is obligated to set aside 3.2% of their research dollars to this Small Business Innovation Research Program. So. DOT participates, Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, NSF, um, you can see all the acronyms there. So we're just one of the smaller players actually a, a program and a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the research dollars in this program are from DOD or NSF. Um, they're, they're the bigger players in this program. So as far as US DOT's SBIR program, there are a number of modal administrations within US DOT that participate today. Of course, we're talking about Federal Railroad Administration. As I mentioned, they are an active participant um, and a, a longstanding participant. And you'll be hearing from Jeff Gordon momentarily, and he administers the program for RFA. I mean, FRA, sorry. Um, but uh, if you're interested in the other um, modal administrations within DOT, they also participate in the program. So who's eligible for the SBIR program? So there are some eligibility requirements and only small business applicants are eligible for this program. And small business is defined by the Small Business Administration as un 500 or fewer employees. That's a fairly large small business. Um, and it's focused on performing R&D, not purchasing already developed equipment. So these are research firms that generally apply for the uh, program. And also the SBIR program for USDOT, the small businesses cannot be majority owned by VCCs or, or hedge funds or private equity firms. And that, that's a key component. Also in terms of eligibility, for the principal investigator, the principal investigator has to be employed 
at least half time with the small business. So some of these firms are rather small and some of the principal investigators are also professors or they have or they are employed by multiple for firms. So the actual principal investigator has to be at least half time employed by the small business that is is applying for the um, program. And the R&D must be performed within the United States and the, the small business must be a, a US firm. So those are two key requirements as well. So for US DOT, the SBI program is about a, generally somewhere around $9 million worth of research every year. Um, generally, we have five to 10 topics per year. Um, so it, in FY21, our solicitation it, it period just ended and we actually just announced our awards today. There were 13 topics in the FY21 solicitation and that was across all the DOT um, modal administration. So there were two topics from FRA. And the way the program worked, it's, it's really a, a three-phase program um, and it starts with phase one and the solicitations are published on an annual basis and um, it generally, we start with uh, phase one, and then once those firms are selected, once those projects are selected, about half of those um, are eligible to, or approved to uh, move on to phase two, and then about a quarter move on to phase two B. All right, so. The, just um, to give you a little bit of a better idea of how the solicitation process works, um, the small business will look in at the solicitation when it's published, and generally the next solicitation will probably be published next winter, and there'll be a list of topics within that solicitation, and then small businesses submit proposals that meet the solicitation requirements. USDOT then conducts the evaluations and they're evaluated by subject matter experts within the USDOT federal staff. So FRA generally would uh, conduct the evaluations for the FRA um, staff, um, for the FRA proposals. Then the DOT selects the awards for phase one and then the contracts are issued by the Volpe Center, which is where I work. For phase one, it's generally a six month project. It's a concept development project. It's $150,000. At the end of phase one, the small business is then eligible to submit a phase two application. And that can be a larger effort, a 24 month project up to a million dollars. It does it generally they're at range anywhere from 150,000, 250,000, 500,000, a million dollars for phase two. It really depends on the requirements of that particular research. And then phase three is when that, re that research moves on to uh, commercialization. So you're getting dollars from uh, somewhere outside the SBIR program. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff Gordon and he's gonna talk more about the type of research that FRA does within the SBIR program. Jeff? Thank you, thank you, Melissa. Good afternoon, everyone. As you've seen before in Mary Amalia Har's slide and, and elsewhere, the R&D office at FRA is organized into three, four primary divisions, track rolling stock, human factors, and train control and communications. This slide just gives you a little idea of, of the kinds of things that we do in each of those divisions. I work in the rolling stock division and manage research programs aimed at improving passenger equipment, crashworthiness, and occupant protection. Um, there's a link at the bottom um, if you haven't seen it elsewhere, and I believe it's in the web link pod if you'd like to learn more about the kinds of things that uh, FRA RDNT does. I've been the FRA's uh, SBAR program manager since 2011. Um, this chart is kind of busy. It's got multiple colors and multiple scales, but the, uh, the basic information is in the little box in the inset in terms of our participation history. Uh, nominally, we, we award four phase ones per year, as Melissa described them. About half of those go on to phase two six months later, and we receive about 40 proposals per year. So that's pretty good. We're very happy with the proposal receipt rate. Um, and the rest of the data are, are there, as Melissa said. Um, the 2021 announcement of awards was made today, <laughs> just before this, this webinar began. And uh, FRA received 14 proposals 
against two topics and selected three of those for award. So um, that's pretty good, kind of consistent with our record here. The 21 topics, FY21 topics that we had in the solicitation that just closed um, are, are briefly described here. Um, the first one was looking at passenger train door safety. Um, subways and, and commuter cars have, have problems with crowding and, and doors closing on people, things, hands, bags, um, feet. And so this topic was looking at a sophisticated way to be able to determine that the door was actually fully closed before the train could depart a station or, or take propulsion. The second one, we were looking at something which may seem mundane to you, but trying to measure different parameters associated with wheels. There are many devices out there now. Each of them has its pluses and minuses. People use them all the time and daily. Um, lots of them are prone to operator error. So what we were looking for was some, somebody who could create something that would give us the soup to nuts, all the measurements we need about a wheel set in a handheld device. So um, at the bottom here, as I said earlier, the, the link was created before the awards were made today. So if you go to the SBIR website, you may see information about the FY21 awards that weren't um, hadn't been made when this slide was created. And uh, here's, a, here's a kind of a list of, of, of the topics that are going on right now. Different projects, um, they're in different stages. Most of them are phase twos. Um, and as you can see, I'm not gonna read them to you. You will receive this presentation later. Um, most of them are, are technical. We're looking for uh, technical solutions to problems that face the railroads. The topics come from our subject matter experts in the various divisions at FRA. I polled them prior to um, the need to create the solicitation that Melissa described. I get ideas from them, we groom them, we write them up into a form that makes it understandable to the small businesses, and then they end up in the solicitation for, um, for review and proposal. So that's um, that. This is one that I have going on right now. Um, it's, it's a pretty interesting one. You may recognize the pictures. They're from an NTS board. Um, that's the Amtrak derailment in Philadelphia and a significant number of fatalities and, and, and damage to the cars was caused by impacts with the derailed coaches and catenary poles. So what this project is looking at is some way to create some resiliency in the catenary poles so that it's less aggressive if struck by a passenger car, but can still perform its role as a catenary pole and hold the wire up. So this is pretty good and it's, uh, it's in its phase two B stage, as Melissa discussed earlier. Um, so that's one that that's going on now, just for your information. And here's one of our success stories. This was a, this was a really good one that happened a couple of years ago. Um, this company, and there's there's a link on the bottom. It's in the web links pod as well. You can see more information that I'm showing here. But there are lots of slips, trips, and falls by engineers and and crewmen on locomotives. And this device that was created allows for the removal of the traditional stairs that are present at the at the side of the locomotive to get up to the cab with something like an escalator elevator kind of thing that has safety interlocks and all and removes the requirement for for climbing stairs which can be a problem if there's snow and ice and, and other debris present so this was a very successful one and i'll toss it back to melissa if you'd like or i can proceed Go right ahead, good staff, why don't you? Uh, yeah, just so you know, that, that, and she alluded to this briefly earlier, there's one solicitation per year. It's generally in the winter, and it will be 21-22 um, timeframe. You can go to the website listed there to sign up so that you you get a notification when things are happening there, and they will point you to the, where the, the solicitation is, the requirements, the... Uh, requirements for proposals and all of that. As, as Melissa said earlier, we don't use grants. These are strictly contracts. And the SBAR program office does not solicit, does not accept unsolicited proposals. We're only interested in your proposal if it's related to an open topic in a solicitation. So here's some contact info for me and the SBAR program office at the Volpe Center. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions that we didn't get to today. And um, thank you for your attention. 
I will now pass it over to my uh, colleague, Doug Gaskin, to talk to you about. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, great. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so my name is uh, Doug Gaskin. I'm the acting chief of the program and policy development division here at FRA. Uh, so my team is responsible for directing the development of uh, the policy and legislative proposals, um, uh, as well as associated policies that go into our uh, the president's annual budget formulation, uh, the discretionary grant programs and the notices of funding opportunities. Um, which is why we're all here today. And we also manage the, uh, the FRA's geographic information system, the program which provides a geographic and spatial analysis of railroad and uh, trend related data uh, for internal and external stakeholders. So the purpose here of the CRISI program is, is pretty straightforward. Um, it's to improve the safety, efficiency, and reliability of inner city passenger rail and freight rail system systems. Uh, Christie program is our is our biggest grant program. Uh, not surprising since it's it's designed to be the big tent for almost any railroad infrastructure project. Uh, if you can think of one, a railroad project, it's likely eligible. Uh, Christie program has enjoyed a strong support uh, from Congress. As you can see, it, it has been funded at or above its authorized levels in recent years. Um, through, uh, I think, five rounds, uh, four fiscal years. There was a, a separate pot of money one year for PTC projects specifically, but uh, the, the department has announced 184 projects uh, under Chrissy, the total about $1.2 billion. So there's a lot of interest, uh, both from the Congress, the administration, and the, and the stakeholders out in the transportation world um, in, in this program. So we're currently working on the fiscal year 21 uh, Chrissy notice of funding opportunity. Uh, we expect to get that out uh, on the street in the next couple of months. Um, in terms of eligible applicants, um, again, it covers a broad range of stakeholders. Uh, I just want to note uh, class one railroads are not directly eligible, but uh, can and do partner with eligible eligible applicants on, on projects. Uh, important note here is, is you know, the TRB uh, the third, the bullet, the third from the bottom. Uh, the TRB must be must be involved in, in this application. They they must be the applicant or official project partner. Um, entities that contract with TRB are not eligible to come in on their own. The design here is really for joint partnerships. Um, in in the uh, the second uh, to last bullet, the university transportation centers. This eligibility is is a little bit broader than the specific UTCs that are named by the department, um, but it does have a couple. Uh, requirements, you know, including must be a university or nonprofit institution of higher education with the transportation component. Um, but if you see uh, some of these other applicants, uh, state agencies apply, um, lots of universities apply under the public agency, um, eligibility, railroad, class two and three railroads, uh, Amtrak, local government. So really a, a really broad range of, of folks are eligible under this program. In terms of um, eligible projects, again, keeping with the big tent for Chrissy, uh, a, base, a, huge, a huge range of projects are eligible, mostly focused on capital improvements, but there are uh, specific eligibilities um, related to the development of safety programs, or workforce development and training, and of course, research, uh, today's main focus. Um, and this is pretty broad uh, in the statute, the way Congress designed this. It's, it's simply any research um, to advance any particular aspect of rail related capital operations or safety improvements. Um, so that's, that's a, that's a wide range. Um, and so we, you know, we really look forward to some ideas, uh, uh coming forth, um, through, through the Christie program, uh, in this, in this next round, uh, there are a couple of carve outs, uh, to be aware of. Um, and note the focus here in the green box is on, uh, trespass prevention. There's sort of two separate pots uh, for trespass prevention projects. Uh, that's um, important. You know, this is a pretty important em emphasis here for, for FRA. And we appreciate Congress appropriating significant funding um, for both the capital projects, which is that 25 million set aside, um, the capital projects and engineering solutions that target trespassing, as well as um, a smaller pot here that, that really is focused on outreach enforcement and education related to trespass prevention. Um, Outside of that, there's a there's a big carve out here for what is uh, 
new inner city passenger rail service routes. Um, there is nothing specific for research, but um, you know, it, it's, it is on outside of these carve outs, uh, the rest of the pot. And again, the appropriated amount was uh, 375 million in fiscal year 21. So this is a, this is a large pot. It's our biggest here at FRA. So uh, we look forward to uh, hopefully seeing a lot of research applications, but, but certainly uh, with a focus on, on trespass prevention would be, would be helpful. And uh, just to recap here, so uh, since the, the fiscal year 20 NOFO hasn't published yet, uh, we can't provide a full briefing on the, on the application process. Just a couple of things to be aware of in, in case you're interested in, in putting an application together for consideration. Uh, it's a little different than um, the BAA and the SBIR program. These are grants, these are competitive grants. Uh, there is a required non-federal match, which is 20% minimum. Um, there's also a statutory preference for projects that include a 50% or more non-federal match. Um, so that's pretty important. Um, and to help guide the application process, um, we in the, the notice of funding opportunity ask applicants to identify uh, the track that their project is applying under. So this has no effect on eligibility. It's really just uh, helps us organize uh, the applications uh, during the evaluation phase. And you can see here under uh, research projects, we come in under track four. Now, no track has any advantage over the other. There's no set amount of money or set sort of determined number of projects out of each track. It's really just helps us uh, organize uh, the intake. And I wanted to highlight a couple of recent grant selections that, that we've seen um, through the Chrissy program. Um, this first one here is from Kansas State. Um, this is pretty interesting. It has a number of partners with it, uh, other universities. It's going to provide, uh, you know, rail industry workforce development and safety research center. Um, this middle one is from the Pennsylvania DOT. It also had a number of partners. We couldn't even list them all here. Uh, the concept here is pretty innovative. It's an innovative approach that could, they could have safety benefits, um, in addition to increased visibility regarding shipments. So it's sort of a uh, onboard GPS uh, sensor system. And uh, this last one here uh, is from uh, Texas A&M. This is interesting. Implements a, it's a drone technology in, in three-dimensional mapping to, to study uh, passive grade crossings in rural areas and determine if unsafe conditions exist for vehicle traffic. So these are just a couple of different uh, types of projects. We've, we've research projects we've funded through Chrissy. You can see there's some sort of pretty different amounts of, of funding, sort of 2.5 million close to 8 million and then, and then 240,000. So, um, you know, we see a, a, a big spread there. Um, and I just want to sort of close, we don't, we don't typically see many research projects that seek funding under Chrissy each year. Um, and I encourage you to, to look out for this NOFO when it is published um, to see uh, if, if you are eligible to apply or if any kind of ideas or projects that you're thinking about are eligible under the Chrissy program, uh, you can certainly reach out if you have any questions. Um, we work very closely with uh, counterparts in the Office of Safety, in the Office of Research and Development, if you have questions. If, um, and again, we want to see projects that um, really, really advance, advance uh, the bar of safety. Um, you know, again, there's a sort of a, a, a recent focus uh, through the Congress that we'd love to see funding trespassing, but obviously grade crossing improvements and anything uh, advanced technology that, that helps you to push uh, push levels of safety and training in, in the industry um, to a much higher level. So that is it for me. I will pass it off to you. Mary. Thanks so much, Doug. Uh, we have some additional polling questions now. Our question is, have you participated in a previous discretionary grant program webinars? Yes, I've participated in a live FRA discretionary grant program webinar. Yes, I've watched a recorded FRA discretionary grant program webinar online. Or no, I have not previously attended or watched any FRA discretionary grant program webinars. It looks like about 81% have not previously attended or watched, about 3% have uh, watched or recorded, and about 16% have participated in a live uh, discretionary grant program webinar. Our next question 
is, do you have experience preparing a benefit cost analysis? Yes, extensive, yes, limited, or no experience? So it looks like about 50% have limited experience, about 20% have extensive, and about 30% have no experience. All right, so that's, that's uh, it for this round of our polls. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today for the Fiscal Year 2021 FRA Funding Research Programs webinar. This webinar will be posted to the FRA's website, the recording, in about a week and the PowerPoint tomorrow. Um, this webinar will be ending in about 60 seconds, so you can copy or screenshot the contact information on the screen. Um, please note that all web links will be emailed to you at the conclusion of the webinar. Again, we appreciate your participation today and your questions, and we hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody. The webinar will be ending in about 30 seconds. The webinar will be ending in 15 seconds. The webinar will be ending in 5 seconds. This webinar has ended. Thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye.